Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Honest Tattooer, the podcast where we talk about everything about tattoos. And most of all, today we have a very special topic. It's all about something that's very relevant to every tattooer, and that's our finances. And uh, we have Matriano, as usual, my hey, co-host. How you doing? We have G Money and our special guest, Ryan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. So, Ryan... I came up to Ryan just on Instagram. I saw his content. It was about, about just financial education. And that's something that I try to, you know, kind of talk to all of my friends about, all of my friends who are tattooers or not tattooers, because I got into it years ago by looking at people like Dave Ramsey and looking at Graham Stephan. And a long time ago, a friend of mine gave me Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it just opened my mind up to a whole new world of just like how you can get responsible and be aware of where your money's going, how you can invest it and things like that. And uh, when I saw your content, it really just resonated with me. And in, um, I've read a lot of books about finance and things like that. And when I saw you kind of just be able to turn that kind of information into a way that a tattooer can relate to it and really feel more connected to how they work, I was like, I got to talk to this guy more in depth and learn more about, you know, what got you into this and, you know, why we're here. Yeah, man. I was stoked to see you reach out. And uh, yeah, I love talking about the stuff. I love, you know, tying tattooing and, and money and art and spirituality and that whole thing is that's my jam. Cool. Sick. So um, one thing like that I struggled with when I first started um, tattooing was that I was getting paid cash every day and I was in my early 20s and I'd like to party. <laughs> and I was not, you know, you're a young 20 year old guy. You just finished working. You have a wad of money in your hand and you feel like, yeah, I can go out and go spend this money. And yeah, I'm going to work again tomorrow. I'm going to make this money all over again tomorrow. And yeah. I think that's one of those, the biggest pitfalls of, yeah. of this industry. And amongst a lot of industries, they work the same way where you're just getting that constant everyday quick gratification because you get that money in your hand that day of and sure. you can go do something that night go do something the next day and then before you know it you're just living day to day and you're in this like hamster wheel and you're not getting off of it you know so like once I started looking at things like what um once you're in a system where like for example if you work for a traditional company you know you're they're deducting your taxes they are putting towards your retirement. You know, they're doing all of these things that in our industry doesn't really, in the majority of shops, that's not how things are done. And uh, depending on like what, uh, what age of a tattooer you are and what, when you started, you know, you either came from a world where it was completely like just pirate world, you know, underground, only cash. I don't report anything. I bury my money in the back of my house and freaking, you know, shit like that. You know, I have a safe with like a hundred grand in it. Like it's insane. You know, I own a bunch of gold chain. Dude, I know dudes that just own gold chains. Yeah. <laughs> like, Man, so uh, <laughs> early on in my career, when I started to making a little bit more money, um, I had a CPA and I asked the guy, I was like, Hey man, you know, I've been getting paid in cash. I got a lot of money in my house. Like, I don't really want to throw it in the bank. So I'm not to claim it and pay taxes on it. Like, what do you think I should do? And his answer was just go buy stuff, man. I'm like, really? That's what I should do. He's like, yeah, just go buy stuff. I was like, that's, <laughs> that's the advice you're giving me. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> so hopefully we can get some better financial advice from Ryan. Today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Honestly, that's, that's it. Just go buy stuff. Just, go buy stuff. just go buy stuff and good luck. <laughs> Best of luck. Yeah. Buy stuff. <laughs> but no, do not buy stuff unless you can absolutely afford it guys. We're not here to be your financial advisors, but we're going to hear Ryan and hear what he has to say. So one thing that did help me a lot in the beginning was to have a system and, and, and follow a system, you know, and a system can give you a little bit of order and a little bit of, a, you know, you can modify a system after a while when, you know, if it applies to you, a couple of different things. And I think that's something special about your course that it's like you have a kind of a system to help people to get them on their way. And I think like, like what you're saying where like everybody has different situations, you know, it's different if you're just, you know, a tattooer year two than if you're a tattooer at, you know, year 20 and you haven't invested in, in, in yourself and your retirement and things like that, your rules are going to be slightly different, you know? Yeah. So what would you, what would you say, you know, for a young tattooer that's kind of like 
they have the world in front of them. They can just, you know, they're new in the game. They can kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, for, well, first of all, I can 100% relate to that feeling of getting out. You know, I worked at on Christopher Street starting at 7 p.m. and worked till 4 in the morning, leaving with over a grand in cash. And, you're, you know, it's like it's a crazy feeling at like in your early 20s to make so much money so quickly. And then, yeah, I mean, I remember one year realizing that I probably made close to, if not over $100,000. And I was like, I don't have any money. Like, where did, where did it all go? go? Yes, where did it all so, go? I'd, I had that feeling too. Yeah, right? And and one thing I heard that I really liked and that I, I use, I didn't come up with this idea, but it's that uh, every system is perfectly designed to produce the results that it gets. So consider that each and every person listening to this has a system, whether you think you do or not. And whatever results you're getting with your money, whether you're living the pirate life or not, or whatever it is, your system is perfectly designed to produce those results. So let's say you're living the pirate life, okay? And you're not paying any or you're undercutting, whatever, right? But you're also not saving and accumulating wealth for the future. So your system is perfectly designed to avoid paying taxes and make sure that you stay broke. Right? That's really what, you, if you're honest with yourself, that's what your system, and I'm not even saying it's good or it's bad or it's right or it's wrong. It's just, is that what you want for it, your life? Absolutely. Right? I think uh, to add to that, like, you know, I had a moment in my life where I was making a ton of money and I was still in the process of transitioning from pirate life to, you know, tax paying citizen, you know, adult, pirate adult, to professional, you know, pirate to professional. Course, that's pretty good. <laughs> pirate to professional. That was the name of my first course. And, uh, <laughs> I went from, you know, like I knew that I made a lot of money and I could show that I made a lot of money in certain ways and I had a lot of cash and I went to go get an apartment that I really wanted. And everything that they were asking, they were like, no. Where's your profit loss statement? They're like, what? No. Like, yeah, you got a bunch of cash, but where the hell is that coming from? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, same thing. Um, when I tried to get a mortgage for my house, man, it was brutal. Brutal. And even just uh, like, not even that, but, uh, my truck. Yeah. You know, truck's yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot less money than a house. I'm like, yeah. man, I could just buy this truck right now. And they're like, yeah, but really, you know, shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a challenge to get my Jeep Wrangler as well. Yeah. yeah. And look, let's say you do. So let's say you saved up all the money to buy a house and you bring a big duffel bag over and they're even willing to accept it. The IRS is going to be like, Where'd you get this? Where'd you get this yeah. money? Uh, yeah, exactly. You this house? And you, you'll we see at you. some point. Yeah, they do. They do see you. And so, even if you could do it, and I, it's funny, you know, I knew when I was like, I'm gonna be the money guy on Instagram, talk about tattoos. Like, I knew I was gonna get all these trolls and crazy. You know, I got people like some of these comments are hilarious. Like, some guy was like, "My retirement plan holds six rounds." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like. Uh, Good for you, dude. If that works for you, if that truly serves what you're called to do and what you want for your life, perfect. I'm not trying to tell you to change your six round retirement plan. All I'm saying is if you don't want a retirement plan that holds six rounds, maybe there's something else. And, uh, and then I get comments all the time. People post on when I talk about taxes, like I've never claimed taxes and it works just fine. for me. I'm like, cool. Dude, awesome. I'm not trying to tell you to do anything. Keep doing what's working for you. Keep, if that's working for you, keep doing it. I, hopefully, the IRS doesn't come knocking on your door trying to figure out where you bought this house and how you have a truck and any of that stuff. And honestly, I don't even want to live with that hanging over my head, like wondering, when are they going to come? When's the SWAT team going to come through the window and shove a calculator up my ass and audit me? You know, uh, I, I always make that joke because I feel like people don't really know what auditing is. And that's, yeah. that's what they think happens. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a little bit different than that. But yeah. Can we, uh, can we just go backwards a couple of minutes? Um, can you just real briefly, can you just real briefly just talk about how you started yeah. um, and why you're doing what you're doing? Yeah. So I... Never, if you told me five years ago, like, hey, Ryan, you're going to, like, stop tattooing pretty much for a living and just be the finance guy who told you you're out of your fucking mind. But I, you know, about six years ago, started my own studio and realized that the tax stuff and the saving stuff and then what the hell I'm supposed to do with retirement, like, it was on my mind and all I wanted to do was tattoo. And I just wanted to focus on that and draw and make awesome tats, right? That's what it's all about. That's but still how I feel now today. That's all I want to do. 
And then this tax shit and all this stuff was like weighing me down mentally. I was like, if I can just figure it out, then I can just focus on doing sick tats and that's it. And that'll be awesome. And then, you know, I, I had a small business coach that was helping me and guiding me because I, I was lost. And I'm like, okay, I figured that out. And, and it got easier. And like, I started saving more money and I saw my investments grow. And I was like, this is dope. And like, I started talking to other artists. Actually, people would sit down in my tattoo chair and I'd be like, so what kind of retirement? You got a Roth IRA or what do you have? What, what are you doing? They're like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, thought, I thought everyone knew what they were doing. I thought I was the only one that didn't know. And something clicked after a while, something switched for me where I got passionate about it. Literally, I'd have clients emailing me like, yo, stoked about my next tattoo appointment. Can't wait to talk more about investing or saving. And, you know, and I was like, there's something happening here. It's should be charging like, those guys double. I should be. <laughs> They're getting double the it. knowledge. I thought about uh, it in the beginning. Tips like, not included for uh, what I spilled. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah. And then, you know, pandemic hit. I had to close down my tattoo studio at a four month old daughter. I'm like, I need to figure out how to make money remotely because I can't tattooing. And that was where I was like, I'm just going to put all my time and energy into becoming a financial coach. I think the world needs it. I want to do it. I'm passionate about it. And I don't know if you ever heard the, like that, the Ikigai, you ever heard that term? It's a Japanese word. It's like the cross section. Uh, it could very, very well be like a, an American thing. That's not really a Japanese term that, <laughs> because we do that all the time. But anyway, it's this concept that uh, it's a cross section between what you're good at, what you like to do, what the world needs and what you can make money doing. And so if you can find something that can cross all those categories, and for me, financial coaching is all of those things. I love doing it, I'm good at it, the world needs it, and I can make money doing it, and it's, it's great. It's awesome. That's such a great concept. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> cool. Awesome. I feel like, you know, I, I went through that stage where I was like, trying to figure out how to do this, because, you know, oh my, a little bit of my backstory, after when I started my tattoo shop with, with friends, you know, uh, none of us really wanted to do the part of the responsibility of a business. You just want to do the cool part. Yeah, we just want to tattoo together and not <laughs> have any boss. You know, we want to just run shit. You know, we just want to be chill. And then you're like, oh, well, somebody has to take the responsibility of doing all of this stuff. And that's when uh, the, I was like, man, we have to create an LLC or an S Corp. And at that point, I had an S Corp instead yeah. of an LLC. Yeah. And, um, then I started like having to navigate the difference between doing individual taxes to doing the taxes for the business and learning about all these things really started opening my eyes about, you know, about looking at, I was like, man, I should have been looking at myself as a business a long time ago. Right. You know, yeah. you know, and I was just looking at myself like as this, as, as a different entity, you know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't looking at myself so objectively of like, all right, man, I'm a business and I have to look at myself as a business, carrying myself as such, saving as such, like doing all of these things that over time, just like in any exercise, you will get better at doing them. You will become more effective at doing them. And then like what he's saying, if you have a system, the system is good, it's going to give you good results, you know? But if you keep following a broken system, you're going to fall apart between the cracks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot harder to make a broken system do what you want it to do then it is to, you know, it's a lot harder to like do what you want to do with that broken system than it is to take the time and put the effort in to get the system to work. Right. And then do what you want to do. It's so much easier to do it that way. But a lot of people are fighting a bad system, trying to get it to work and, and it's not. And they're like avoiding taking the responsibility. You know, like great power comes great responsibility. Well, with yeah. great responsibility comes great freedom in my experience. And when I took responsibility for my finances, it, it afforded me a lot of options, a lot of freedoms. Mm -hmm. I just expanded my tattoo studio for the fourth time in five, six years. And I had the funds to do that because of systems I put in place six years ago. You know, if, if I hadn't done that then, I would not have been in the position I am now to take advantage of opportunities that, that showed up. Yeah. Can you talk about some of those systems? Like, yeah. let the, uh, the listener know, like what, what's Absolutely. something that they could do to Absolutely. help? Absolutely. So, uh, I am a big proponent of automation. At the end of the day, if I have money coming into my life and I'm managing that money, then I'm gonna- I believe in automation 100%. Yeah, if I'm, here's the deal. And I'm gonna admit something that no one wants to hear their financial coach admit, I'm bad with money. 
my systems are good with money. So my systems manage 60% or 70% of the money that comes into my life. And then I manage 30%. I could light that 30% on fire and it won't matter because my retirement's on track. I'm on track to buy a house. I'm on track to do all these things. You know, it's, it's the system's doing it. So automation and it, automation is scary when your income is irregular because you can't, to, to my knowledge, there aren't really great ways for banks to uh, transfer percentages of deposits yet. I'm hoping they do change this. And when they do, I'm going to have to change up my systems. But honestly, I don't even like the percentage model because if I know I need to save $560 a month between now and 30 years from now in order to retire, right? I don't want to save a percentage of my income. I want to save $560. What you have to do to get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the difference. That's the difference, you know? And when I set up that automation, so that's one automation is my Mm. retirement account gets automated. Right. And I'll talk about a couple others that I do. Um, My, it, it creates this flow, almost like a siphon where money energy flows through my life. And then when I say, okay, I'm going to automate my living expenses. Right. And so my rent, my bills, my utilities, my phone bill, uh, my subscriptions, all those, odd, all those things that I know every month, no matter how irregular my income is, those expenses are already spoken for at the beginning of the month. So I don't need to save a percentage of my income. I need to save $2,800 a month, right? So I need to automate that and I do it on a weekly basis because I, as a tattooer, I get paid frequently. So you know, do it as frequently as possible. So when um, you say automate, just to be clear, you're talking about like automatic payment towards these bills that you So have, that, right? not just that. But I have my, so my business account is like the portal through which money enters my life, okay? But money in my business account is not my money. It hasn't yet become my money. It has to go through my Mm -hmm. whole system, be filtered through it to then become my money. And that's the way I think about it. Like that's a mental concept that I like to use. So I want to put a pin on that also because I want to come back to that concept a little bit. Sure, sure. So one, I just want to give you a high five because God damn, everything you're saying is so good. (laughs) God damn it. Straight up. Like everything that you're saying are things that I've learned over the course of many, many years of trials and failures and just trying to figure it out. And here you are saying like, Hey man, look, I went through these tries and failures. I figured this thing out and I'm trying to help you get to fucking the holy land of yeah. peace of mind that you get from like having these things happen like automatically. And like, you know, I had to learn that from owning a business and it's like, you know, you start seeing owning a money. business is the best business school. Oh Don't go God. to business school. It'll freaking Just fucking teach start a quick. business and <laughs> fail like, over and over again until you like, make it work. Oh, That's man. the best education. But just like having the money come into the business and be like, yo, that ain't my money at all. That is no idols and no idols is its own thing. It's its it own thing. It ain't me. Yeah. You know, and then even the money that I make from tattooing still ain't mine. It still isn't mine. You know, exactly. I still consider myself like an employee of my business, you know, so that belongs to them. And then at the end of the day, like I've created, you know, automated systems where as soon as like money comes into one account, that money gets broken into mm-hmm. multiple places. Yeah. It's going to go to this. It's going to go to that. And, and, and then what's left that's mine, you know, like that's, that's my money. That's the one that I get to buy myself my dope fucking clothes from. Just so, so you guys So know most I people, eat. they try to spend and live their, pay their bills, <clears throat> buy food, go out, do the thing. And then they try to save what's left over. Yeah. You will always be chasing money if you do it that way. Absolutely. You need to save first. And this is also called like the profit first method. And by the way, you know, you might, your business might be no idols, but every tattooer can do this. Yes. You don't need to own a shop. Like your money coming in through your tattoos is not yet your money until it goes through your system. If you think it's your money, well, again, that system is going to produce a certain set of results. So if you stop thinking about it as your money and start thinking about, okay, where is this money already spoken for, right? A portion of my income is already going towards rent. So let me separate that from the get-go. A portion of my income is already going to my retirement account. A portion of it already is going to my emergency fund if I have debt that I'm paying off, I need to prioritize that. And then I spend what's left over. I don't save what's left over. I live off, I spend what's left over after all of the things that I prioritize. And actually Russ Abbott helped me come up with a name for my money system and I call it the waterfall money system because it prioritizes everything at the top of the waterfall and every step down the waterfall that the money flows is less important. It has less priority. And down at the bottom is me buying stupid shit I don't need. Right. 
One, Shout out to Russ Abbott, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking legend. Yeah. The guy has influenced. Yeah. Like, I get a whole thing just talking about how much Russ Abbott influenced me in tattooing early in my career and just in the tattooing sense, you know? But now he's, like, influencing people in so many other ways. Like, just... Dude, he's the guy's such a, a businessman. Yeah, he's a fucking legend. Um, Shout out to Ross Abbott. You're the yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the posts that you put up, I don't know if it was recent or within the last couple of months, you talked about all these different bank accounts that you have. Yeah. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So that's a part of the system, right? There's So there's investment accounts and then there's bank accounts. Uh, I don't really think there's... There's not much else to the system besides like some bookkeeping software, but it's really just, if you looked at the pieces that make up the system, it's a bunch of bank accounts, it's a bunch of investment accounts, and it's bookkeeping software. And that's really it. I don't use apps. I don't use like any of these fancy apps like Mint and stuff out there. I'm yeah. sure they serve a purpose, but I actually use none of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that post was about how I have eight different bank accounts. The truth is I actually have more than that, but those are the ones that I really wanted to highlight because those were the most important. You know, um, if you travel, for instance, and you know that twice a year you're going to spend a thousand dollars on play kit tickets and hotels. OK, you can either scrounge up that grand twice a year or I mean, I could do the math on my phone, but you could say, OK, roughly I spend about two grand a year. I'm going to divide that by 12 and then divide that by four or divide it by 52 weeks in a year. And then you can say, OK, I actually just need to put away whatever the math is on that eighty three dollars a week. And then I know that my travel funds are already covered and it's way easier to save $83 a week than it is to just come up with a grand all at once. And when you do this and then you do it for your groceries and you do it for your rent and um, what else did I have on there? Uh, even just like, I, I have like a bigger fund of like buying stupid shit I don't need that's like a little more baller shit, you know? When I break it up, then my irregular income becomes a little bit more stable. And I don't live in this cycle of feast or famine because I've, I've created stability around the flow of money. The other thing it does, and I touched on this, is like this, and this is a little bit more in the like metaphysical manifestation world, but when you create this automated flow, it, it's like a siphon, pulling money through your life and then pulling more money into your life to support the system. So we're afraid to automate our finances because our money, our, is, our income is irregular, but we actually need to automate it to create more regularity. And therein lies this like paradox that is part of what I walk people through to, to help them, you know? That's great. Yeah. So all well, these accounts, do you have them inside one bank or do you have it? No. It's all different banks. It's primarily, I have two banks, but I actually like to operate. I teach people to use two banks. I like to have like three or four banks I'll set up a bank account just like randomly. I'll hear about some new bank with a high yield savings interest. I'll set it up and I'll just throw like a $5 a week transfer into that account if there's no fee. And I'll just forget about that shit. And, I'll, and then like two years later, I'll be like, oh wait, there's like $2,000 sitting in this account. And I, I, I feel safe. Like it actually builds this sense of safety when I know I'm like tricking myself into saving more. Same thing where like I had one client, uh, she knows who she is, I love you, but you need to stop paying for the Sims because you subscribe, <laughs> you subscribe to the Sims and you were paying for that shit for like way too long. And it's the same concept where you like, it's so easy to set it up, but then we're, we're lazy. I mean, we're not, I'm, I'm a hardworking motherfucker, but like as human beings, we naturally go towards the path of least resistance. Of and so when you set up that automation, it's like, oh, I gotta like cancel this thing and you're just going to let it happen. And through that, you're sort of using, I like that it's already a part of our psyche to go the path of least resistance. So I'd rather leverage something that already exists in you than rather try to teach you a new habit. I do teach you new habits, but anytime I can leverage a, a already existing system within you, I'm going to, I'm going to use that to your advantage. I feel like I'm taking this podcast as like, I'm the listener right now asking the questions that maybe the listeners would also be asking. Cause yeah. I, for having my own LLC for the last 15 years, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. I still feel like I know nothing at all. Yeah. I don't know where my money goes. I don't know why I'm paying, you know, the things that I pay for. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you don't mind, I just feel like I can just bombard you with a shit ton of questions. Yeah. That's maybe that's that'll great. help yeah. a lot of people. Absolutely. I mean, so I feel like I'm at a point where I've learned a lot of things, but I still haven't managed to like perfect 
my systems, you know, because I have a system that, you know, for, for myself. And um, at the same time, it's, it's a matter of like looking back at, you know, what you've done good, what you should improve on, et cetera, do make those, you know, and it's been a, a thing that I've been doing for years now. Just like, yeah. all right, these, you know, cause I've been, I keep changing, you know, like I wasn't a dad, you know, five years ago. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and these things will change your life. You know, like once you're like, oh man, now I do think about starting a family, you know, like these things are going to change. And I think like what you touched on earlier about when you were 28 and you're like, and that hits and you're like, oh shit, I'm about to be 30 years old. You know, like, uh, cause like when you're a young 24, 25 year old, you're like, I got all this time to, I'll save later. I got to be 30 years old. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, you know, like it's that. And then all of a sudden you are, you're like, oh shit. You know? And then man, you know, what's crazy. And I'll share this. Like I know the years between like 26 to like 30, I was working six days a week and I was tattooing easy, you know, seven hours, eight hours a day. I wouldn't really be tired because I'm fucking a young man just crushing, you know? And I think I made so much money. And then like when I was like 35, I looked at like, holy shit. During those 10 years, I never really put money towards my retirement. You know, I didn't think about like, I saved money to do things and be able to get things and have like a safety net but I didn't put money towards my retirement. And when it comes down to compound interest, time is your best friend. Yeah. You know they what say, I'm saying? They say time in the market beats timing the market. So everyone's wondering, 100%. what's the best time to invest? The best time to invest is probably 10 years now. ago. <laughs> 10 years ago, right. If you didn't invest 10 years ago, then maybe now might be yeah, the best time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and time in, so I, I usually tell people like, look, any way you crunch the numbers, like it's probably going to take you 30 years to save enough money to live for 15 to 20 years off of your retirement fund. So whenever you get started, think 30 years from then is when you might be able to retire depending on how you do it and what ways, you know, how much you're contributing. And if you run the numbers, I mean, it's, if you start when you're 25, oh my God, you save yourself you're crushing so oh. much headache later on and every year that you wait it increases the amount that you need to put away exponentially by by, so much by so much so time in the market right if you gave yourself 40 years the numbers I, i i do some free webinars and stuff here and then i talk about this but like i i show the difference between if you saved and invested for 20 years and 30 years it's nuts i mean it's the, the, the amount that you make a passive income based on historic returns, right? And nothing, nothing is guaranteed. You know, I'm not promising you the same kinds of returns in the future, but I base it off of the past 50 years of historic returns in the market. The returns in 20 years, you don't, the, the last 10 years, that an extra 30, what makes it 30 years, you earn more in that last 10 years than you do in the entire first 20 years. Wow. That's how powerful it is. The compound interest is insane. The compound interest is insane. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah, one thing that like uh, I will say to everybody, like right now, inflation is crazy. Things are hard. The markets are extremely down. Everything, every market, crypto market, stock market, everything's down. You know, this is when people are like, you know, uh, I remember this Warren Buffett quote, you know, that is when people are fearful, be greedy. And when everyone's greedy, be fearful. Yep. You know? Yeah, I wish I knew that when I invested into uh, crypto because <laughs> I lost a lot of money. And then when it dropped down to three thousand dollars, no one wanted to buy it. Yeah, yeah. But everyone was fearful. Yeah, and that that's the time to buy. Been, you know, that's the time to go. Like right now, it is the time to hodl. You I, know? I talked to someone recently. It was uh, you know I, I helped her get set up with a retirement account when I was working as an advisor and. Uh, she was like, yeah, you know, I saw the markets weren't doing too good. So I paused my retirement reoccurring investment. And I was like, that's, that's actually the opposite. The opposite I, of I return, get like yeah. from like a emotional standpoint and it, the, so the average return in the market is roughly 10% per year, but the average return that the average consumer, the ra- a regular investor gets is 5% per year. Now you were like, why is that the case? If the average return of the S and P 500 is 10%, it's because of two things and it's fear and greed emotions are the most expensive thing when it comes to investing. So, you know, this person stopped 
pause their investments because emotionally they were like, ooh, that's scary. But if you look at historic returns in the market, these are the times where fortunes can be made if you continue to invest. And so I never stop putting money in my retirement account. I don't care what the market's doing. I don't care. I have that shit on repeat over and over again, dollar cost averaging every single week I invest. In fact, historically, Tuesdays, apparently, if you had back tested every day of the week throughout the history of the market, if you invest on Tuesdays, you see the highest return. I don't know why that is, but hmm. that's been the history yeah. of the market. Yeah. So people eat, breathe, drink water, shit, invest in the market. That's it. <laughs> like straight up. Are you printing that shirt? <laughs> <laughs> like straight up. All those things are the things that you need to do in life. So no matter the, what the situation, stay focused. Stay focused on your goals. I think that uh, like it's easy to get sidetracked. Like sometimes when you see that, you know, like, oh man, like, like what you're talking about. Like, oh man, I invested when things were high. And I saw that things drop, you know, but like this, this is your opportunity to start cost averaging down you know yeah in a long-term basis you know because i'm right. like oh yeah you like that's why when you know you start investing you want to think about the long term you know you invest with a purpose of like i'm not investing for john's today i'm investing for john when he's old for that so guy i have this concept that i call your inner elder so you've heard of like doing inner child work, right? You've had some childhood traumas. You want to bring that up and you want to talk. You want to build a relationship with your inner child and heal some of that trauma. Well, I think you want to build a relationship with your inner elder and think about 80-year-old Ryan. Man, he's been tattooing. His back is fucked. He wakes up in the morning. He's tired and achy. And like the last thing he wants to do is think about going down to the shop and fucking slinging scabs, you know, like he's like cream soap stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just think about him. Like I really think about my future self as this person and, and think about what are his wants and his needs? What is, what is his day? Like? like he probably just wants to go for a walk down a chill path. Like that's probably all he wants to do his day. And the last thing he wants to do is like have to fucking go bake, make the donuts, you know? And uh, so my investments, my long-term planning, my systems, everything comes down to, am I taking care of, my inner elder. That's great. That's great. So um, let's, uh, let's circle back. So you've got your systems. You've got your bank accounts. Um, what, else, what else do you do or what else do you advise people on what they yeah, should uh, so, take care of? So one thing is, uh, you know, speaking of systems and like John, you're saying, you know, you have your systems, but like, could they be better? So I think everyone's systems, including my own, could always be better. Your life's always changing and and your life is always going to change faster than your systems change. That's why. That's the reason why. It's because oh, like, this what's is true hundred percent of the yes, time. You're 100%. never hundred percent. Like yeah. nothing remains the most constant thing in life is change. You know, so it's like exactly. what worked for me five years ago is probably not gonna work like ten years from now. Like it's it's not gonna be. It's not gonna be. So you have to constantly and it, it's always like the necessity creates the change. Like yeah. it, it you have to get to the point where like, wait, something's not working again. What's what's happening? So you were like, oh, fuck. I have to re look back and reanalyze things and, and try to make those changes. But I feel like if there was more open conversation and more dialogue between even just our peers, you know, because I feel like there's a huge kind of disconnect sometimes when I try to talk to younger tattooers about these things. Just like if like my parents would try to talk to them about it, like they don't want to hear me talk about this shit. Yeah. They just don't want to hear it. And I'm like, I get it. I was there, bro. I want to, <laughs> I want to help you be in a better situation, you know, when you're at my point in my career, you know, and it's like, man, if I had anybody in my life, you know, which is like the difference of like, um, my mentors were pirate mind mentality tattooers, you know, that's what they instilled in me. And then over the years, I've had to like, learn to like, I have to relearn these things, you know, and I didn't really have mentors to really like guide me. It had to be just read some books, find some information, and life. Those are the things that taught me. So like to have people like yourself and that are kind of, hey, there's this information that you should know and uh, I can help you out, build something for yourself so you can have a much better outcome over the years. Because like you said, if you start at 25, it's so much easier that you start at 35. Yeah, Like it's crazy the difference that those 10 years make. And the I think what's crazy is like the level of like how productive 
you can be at 25 is very different than how productive you can be at 35, 45, you know? Especially if you got kids. And especially mm-hmm. if you got kids, you know? So like, uh, I mean, I'm the first one to, tell, to admit that like, the, when I was 25 years old, my goals were like, I wanna freaking travel, I wanna fuck bitches, I wanna party. Like, that, those were the, like, the things, my goals in life were that. Like, now I'm about to be 40 years old, my goals are like, I wanna provide for my family, I wanna like, you know, give my son the best school that he can go to. I want to give him all these things. I want to make sure that when me and, and my girl are, you know, 65 years old, we don't have to scramble for money. I want to make sure that we're okay. You know, so th- like all these things have changed in my life. My values, my things have changed. And over time, the way that I manage my money had to change with it, you know? So it's like-, like Speaking of like your goals and, and saying like, well, okay, so the systems, but what else? Yeah. Goals, and I think this is a topic that's very misunderstood, very related to in a lot of disempowering ways because people are afraid to set goals because then if they don't achieve the goal, then they beat themselves up or whatever. So I think that the problem is actually we're not setting goals that truly inspire us. We're setting goals we think we can do. And then if we don't do them, we're bummed that we don't do them. Yeah. But if you're inspired by your goal, Right. If you really and it, I look at it almost like a muscle, like you kind of have to stretch. We're not used to thinking like, wait, what do I really fucking want? We're used to thinking like, what do I think I could possibly do if the circumstances allowed it? You know, you're capable of so much more than you allow yourself than you give yourself credit for. And the problem is you're thinking within like a small plant pot. Right. And when you put that plant in a bigger pot, when you think bigger and you set goals that truly fucking inspire you and actually they need to fucking scare you. If your goals do not slightly make your gut feel like you fucking going down on a roller coaster, those goals aren't big enough. Those goals aren't really going to work for you and inspire you. And those big goals are like a big plant pot and you can start to take new actions because you're seeing your life from a different perspective. And I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, um, The Patriot with Mel Gibson. You know, he says to his son, he's teaching his son to shoot. And he says, uh, I want you to, I don't want you to aim at the head. I want you to aim at the ear. Because if you aim at the head and you miss the head, right, you're, you're not going to hit your target at all. But if you aim at the ear and you miss the ear, you're still going to pretty much accomplish what you set out to do. So if you set a really big goal and you're like, okay, I'm gonna build a plan and what, how many tattoos would I need to do every year and what would I need to actually charge per tattoo in order to accomplish these financial goals? Set up a real plan for yourself. Aim small, miss small. That's the lesson in that movie. Yeah. So then if you don't end up doing exactly that many tattoos and you don't always charge that amount and you don't get, but at least you're going to make so much more money. You're going to accomplish so much more in a shorter period of time because you set these goals that kind of fucking freaked you out and you're not afraid. You're not attached to the outcome. So one coach I used to work with, uh, and I've hired a lot. Of, I've spent probably close to $100,000 in my lifetime on coaches, coaching programs, mentors. I've invested in myself. You invested in yourself. That's, as, you took the words right out. As I Hormozzi was says, that. I, like, I, don't, you know, I don't invest in the S&P 500, invest in the mm. SME 500. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you got to invest in yourself. I, I'm a huge believer in that. You know, yeah. like, you know, I've had, you know, oh man. Dude, you were just talking about this on your post today. Like, why do I dress the way that I dress? Like, that's just investing in you. That's making it's you feel good. Like, It makes yeah. you feel good. Like, you know, there's a level of like, you know, the things that you do are going to, one, make you feel good and also change the way that you see the world and the, the way the world sees you, you know? So, like, if you're walking around with the stress of like, oh, no, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to pay my bills, th- that, that shines through you. Yeah. That, that stress that you have in your life, people see that. They feel it somehow. You don't and have so to that, tell them. That brings me right to the third element. So my, my program is a three-tier. There's always three pillars, right, of every program, the three pillars of success, right? Uh, so we talked about systems. We talked about goals. That last part is mindset. And if you are living in fear and worry around money, all that's doing, th- that fear and that worry is not putting you in a better position to improve your financial situation. In fact, every financial choice that you make from a place of fear and scarcity and worry is probably one of the worst financial decisions you could make. So really taking some time to shine a light 
on your awareness of money. Look at the beliefs you have around money. Are they serving you? Are they costing you? And if you if you really look at every belief around money, I had a great session the other day where, man, this guy I was working with in the group, in the course, like he popped like a kernel of popcorn. Like his mind was just like, he saw that his relationship with money was costing him so much more than it was paying off. Like there's this payoff, this instant gratification, right? He, uh, you know, grew up pretty poor, uh, you know, uh, poverty, didn't really know anyone in his family, his surroundings, like no good opportunities. And, you know, in his social circles, like sneakers, that was like the sign of success. Of success, you know? yeah. And so he grew up and his belief system was like, I need to, I need to prove that I'm enough. And the way I prove that I'm enough is every new drop. I'm I gonna, need that drop, I need right. that. You know, he was like, do you have Nike money? Like that was, that was the, the epitome of success. It was like, if you have I Nike need those money new Jays, or you have bro. pay less money, which one is it, you know? Yeah. And he saw, they're like, all right. I said to him, and I, I love this conversation I, I, every time. I'm like, okay, so the payoff is for an hour or two, you get to feel like hot shit because you just bought the new whatever, right? And that's, that's the payoff. That's why you believe this about money because it makes you think that you're enough. Now, what's it costing you? He said, well, this belief that, you know, I need to purchase this to feel like I'm enough is, well, it's costing me everything. It's costing me my relationships with my family, my friends, my coworkers, my, you know, my retirement, any house. And it's like, okay, so listen, if I came to you, if I, had a, if I put a, a street shop like sign and I'm like selling, I have the best deal in the world, okay? I'm gonna sell you two to three hours a week of feeling like the hottest fucking shit in the world, okay? It's gonna be dope. You're gonna feel so fire for two to three hours a week, all right? And all you have to pay me is everything you ever wanted in your life. Deal? I put my hand out. Deal? You want to take that deal? He's like, no, I don't want to take that deal. It's like, but you take that deal every fucking time. You shake that hand every time you're putting money into things that do not truly serve you. And he popped like a, he was like, oh my fucking God. He saw it in a way that he's forever changed. And I love those moments of working with someone. And that's what the power of coaching is. You'll see your blind spots in a way you can't see. If I asked you, John, is, Show me where your blind spots are. You can't yeah. tell me. You can't. It's like, it's, it's it's having those aha moments. You're like, yes. What? You're like, what? <laughs> You're like, I see the mo. I see the light. You know? Those uh, reality checks are like the greatest life lessons you can never have. Absolutely. My favorite coaches. I would say, like, I want a coach that you truly feel the love. I asked one of my, my coaches when I, he, he was teaching me to be a good coach. He was like, I was like, you know, worried about, you know, what if people don't like me or I do a bad job as a coach? He's like, honestly, as long as you show them that you love them and you do genuinely love and care about them, you could almost be bad at coaching and you will still be good compared to someone that's good at coaching, but like doesn't actually care. And so my favorite coaches that I've ever worked with are people that deeply care, but they're fucking savage. They are a razor blade and they're so precise and they can point out that exact thing that I don't want to look at. I don't want to talk about. I don't want to admit, but because it's coming from someone that loves me, I will hear it and see it in a way that changes my life. Yeah. I, used, I started as a personal trainer and before that I did different sorts of sale, anything from like uh, uh, just working in, in telemarketing, you know, and I, I, I like read like, Sig Ziglar books, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like straight up sales books, like sales strategies. I want to put a pin in this because I want to circle back to this, but yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. like little things like that, where it's like, and all those things have helped me out in life in different yeah. ways, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So like I learned so many like sales tactics about leading with emotion, about connecting with your, like the person that you're talking to in an emotional way of like, what got them here? What do they need to fill them and yeah. make them feel good, you know? Yeah. And then applying those things in different ways. But I had a, a coach that was like just brutal because he would look at me and he would see what I could do. And when I know that I couldn't do it, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Right. He saw my potential. He was like, nah, dude, I know you can do way better than this shit. And he would be like, his name is Randy. Randy Homola, and he was like, honestly, one of the people that made me want to be fully tattooed because the <laughs> VP of a company, and he was tatted the fuck up just like all of us are. More tattooed than both of you guys are. <laughs> it's not saying much about me. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm saying. That. <laughs> but he was tatted up working in corporate America, and he was just a savage salesperson, you know, just 
brilliant salesperson and knew how to connect with people and is one of those people that in a room within five minutes, you're like, yeah, I, I'm whatever you say. Yeah. Yes. You're just like, yes, this so, guy's, he I want to talk about sales a little bit because I've realized, I've noticed, you know, we're in winter time and it's on Instagram, everyone's slow season, cancellations, all this stuff. Right. And I'll talk to tattooers and I'll say, okay, well, maybe you need to reach out to people and, you know, stir up a conversation and, and really engage, you know, get them into a sales conversation. And a lot of tattoo artists I've noticed are really resistant to Where's Doug? Sales. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your buddy? Yeah. Because Man. we Where's your have this idea of sales or a salesperson or being salesy as like kind of being a scumbag. A negative thing. A negative yeah. thing. You know, no. you picture like a dude in a trench coat, like walk knocking at your door trying to sell you a vacuum cleaner, right? That's yeah, what you yeah, think yeah. of. I was thinking but of like a dude in a brown suit going like, hey, do you want to buy this brown used suit. car? There's lemon, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's actually a book. Uh, I, I read a lot of books on sales and it's a lot. Of, it's all psychology, but, but dude in a brown suit is one of the first images that comes to people's minds yeah. when they think of sales. Yeah. And the, re the reality is sales is nothing more than finding a desire for something or a need for something that someone genuinely has. I'm not, I can't make you want to get tattooed you want to get tattooed. You want to get tattooed. Right. That's why you sorry. walked into this place. Exactly. <laughs> You're fishing. And now the difference between you walking into this place and getting a sick fucking tattoo that costs eight grand or you coming into this place and getting a tiny tattoo or walking out with nothing is how well can the artist truly listen for what is it that you really want that maybe you don't even know or you aren't really ready to admit. And then that artist can make that idea come to life in your mind in a way that you had no idea. You didn't walk in here thinking, I wanna get a fucking full fucking sleeve. You came in here thinking, I wanna be a little sexier than I am now, or I wanna be a little, feel tougher. Or, or, what or even do? like, uh, I, I wanna commemorate this thing. Right. I wanna, you know, my family means a lot to me and I want them in these five rose petals. And you know, I want their names there because they're the most important thing in my life. And I was like, you can totally tell that story in a stronger visual way that still means just as much and to some you. tattooers will hear that person and just be like nah i'm not trying to put 15 names and 45 rose petals and shut them down shut them down or with if zero, you know what you're doing with zero options with zero like, options or if you just listen to like okay this person doesn't know what they want they want to commemorate their family and they want to do it in a dope way and if right. you sell them on a vision that's beyond anything that they saw and then you come out with a price that's probably a little bit outside of what they thought they were going to want to spend, but you inspired them. And then they walk out with a tattoo that's far better than whatever they were going to get. It. Yeah, they even Because they were going to walk out of the shop and go down the block to some asshole that's going to do the 50 rose petals with all the 18 names crammed in there. Right. Dude. And get a shitty tattoo for a cheaper price when they could have worked with you. And, and it really comes down to... Can you sell a tattoo? And just because you can do a tattoo doesn't mean you can sell a tattoo. And this is a Correct. really important concept that Correct. people need to start talking about, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. There's, a, there's this mindset of tattooers where, for whatever reason, they think that they're above like the client that's walking in. And mm. they're, they have this, uh, this mentality. Tattitude. That, like, Yes. Tattitude. <laughs> yeah, they put themselves on a higher level and they, I, I've seen it so many times that somebody comes in with a, a tattoo idea that- you Excited, know, excited about yeah, shit. Yeah, well, yeah. not even that. If they come in, come in with an idea that's not that great, right? It could be improved upon. Instead of selling them on that better idea, they just be like, nah, man, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. Yeah. It's right. below it's, me. Uh, yeah. not what I do. Yeah. yeah. It's not what shut I do. them down. They're yeah. like, oh, shut down your idea. Oh. Your I mean, idea is stupid. I'll I give you a perfect like example today. Nobody answered my, uh, Caro was the only one who answered. I put yeah. a, a thing in a group chat today of all, all the tattooers that work at No White Owls. Someone emailed, DMed, someone DM'd me today a photograph that they found on Google. It was a black and gray small tattoo with, uh, it was like some uh, some black girl with a big fro, no face, but there was a lettering all inside her body. Yeah. And this girl, she just goes, hey, how much would you charge for this? Um, I could have been a dick and I'm like, I'm, I'm not doing that. 
you know, I don't do that. Goodbye. Right. Or just ignored it. Yeah. Or ignored it, which <laughs> probably a lot of people would have done. People right? would just do it. Like ignore it. Um, uh, going back to automation, which, you know, has nothing to do with what you were talking about with the finances, but I have an, but it autom- does, yeah. I have an automated reply with someone who emails me or DMs me something that I do not do. It's not the style of work that I do. I say, Hey, that's a cool idea. Unfortunately, that's not the style I work in. You can, uh, we could set you up with a consultation. We could talk about other ideas, something that will fit my portfolio style. You'll be happy with, we can do a win-win, or I could set you up with somebody else who would work in this style and you would be happy, the other person would be happy too. Yeah. And whether or not I get that sale or it's somebody else in the shop, that I feel like that's a win for me too. Absolutely. But there's a lot of people who are like, nah, I don't do it. I don't want to deal See with it. See you later. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to work with this person or most of all, educate them. Because most of the time, that's all they need. You know, like somebody comes to you with like a terrible idea <laughs> with a lot of meaning to them, you know, but they, they don't know how to convey it. They don't have the visual, you know, connection that we have. Maybe they're like, they're a freaking, uh, what do you call this? A freaking, uh, uh, an accountant, you know, and they have no visual art brain at all, you know, and if you're able to show them with words, even, you know, you don't even have to draw something for them most of the time. It's just like, tell them what you could do for them and the opportunity that they could have to have something that's amazing, that they will still connect with, that it's better than what they could have seen. Man, you'll have a client that's going to come back to you over and over and over and I think I've said this numerous times. I've worked in shops where there were guys that were terrible at tattooing, but fucking amazing at selling tattoos. Yeah, and, right. And amazing at building relationships with their clients. So guess what? Their clients, maybe they didn't get a great tattoo, but they got a great friend out of the whole experience. And they'll love the tattoo because oh, they love the love experience. Yeah. And yes. they'll send all their friends there. And that person's gonna have a very successful tattoo career Absolutely. regardless right. of the strength. So if you can combine sales abilities, I mean, it's a skill, it is, um, and it is a skill. You can learn, you can get better at sales. Yeah. You don't have to be, you know, even if you're introverted, you can absolutely learn to get better at sales. Uh, and you're an amazing tattooer, well, then you've just hit the jackpot. Yes. I have friends who are some of the most talented artists that I'll, I will never touch a fucking toenail to some of these friends of mine. They're so good and they struggle with sales. They struggle with marketing. They struggle with you know, putting themselves out and it is, it is a skill, but you, know, you have to want to develop that skill as well. It doesn't necessarily come naturally. The fact you brought up marketing, I think that's one of those like, you know, I would say tattooers struggle with marketing finances and then overall just had to organize their lives so then all these little things just work flawlessly you know where it doesn't feel like work yeah because i feel like every tattooer got into tattooing because they didn't want to like work work you know we didn't want to like have to feel like man i knew when i got like my neck tattooed i was like i don't want a regular job you know what i'm saying that's why i got my neck tattooed. <laughs> you're like, I, like <laughs> I want to sign the contract that says i never get a normal fucking job <laughs> yeah. right now <laughs> yeah like i don't want to be in that kind of office <laughs> This is going to go hands, neck. I don't want that deal. You I mean, that's like the 2020 tattooer now. Like, I'm not going to get anything on my arms. I'm on my, starting you know, there. Just starting my hands, my neck, and, and my face. Neck, and then I ended down. up becoming a licensed financial advisor. <laughs> <laughs> I failed. I failed in life. <laughs> well, it's like I feel a, like we could do a whole episode just on marketing, like social media marketing. Absolutely. Like, you got to get Russ. You got to get Russ here. Yeah, we got to get can him talk about that forever. He is a genius when it comes to that stuff. And He's the way crushed he, it on that. I even talked to him about like my shop and the way I want to design it. He's like, no, no, no. Hear me out. And he just broke it down like you want people to be transported to a whole new world when they come to your tattoo shop. So it's this special experience and he changed the way I think about it. He's actually been talking a lot about pricing and marketing a lot and uh, yes. and he's working on some courses and some really cool stuff on that. So yeah, you I gotta, spent you some gotta time, get him out here. You know, wow. I spent some time talking about that, you know, just because like um, each shop is in, is very unique. You know, how, how kind of like every person tries to run it and stuff like that. And I was like, Look, I, I started this shop where it was a private studio and then now it's morphing into something else and I'm trying to find the balance between having a shop that was once private and now is more of like a, you know, a street shop. It was something that was once before it was a collective, but now it's a business, you know? Right. How do you still make it where everybody feels happy, everybody feels good? 
And there is no wrong right answer to this. Right. You yeah. know, it, it, the personalities and the people that you have there are going to dictate what, what works, you know, and it's going to be a lot of like trial of different things. And I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out in a way where like um, <coughs> in tattooing, you have artists that like to be very self-reliant, you know, they, they like to micromanage their own work. They, and then you have artists that want to be kind of, I want you to do more for me because I, I, you know, like what you're saying, there's some introverted, introverted artist that to them sales, they're like, I put, just put a skin in front of me so I can just tattoo them. I don't want to. I was talking to someone the other day about how, if you do this one thing, this will change your marketing on Instagram significantly. Just show your face. Just show your fucking face. Oh, man. Just a couple, just once a week, just be like, hi. I don't, it doesn't have to say anything profound. Just show just who show you your face. are. Show who you are. That one little change will change the whole way that you're perceived on social media. Can I show you? <laughs> Whenever I do that, I lose so many followers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on your face. It depends on your face. No, but it, no, I agree. I think one thing is, is talking. Like, uh, talking. Yeah. Talking. And the huge thing is that uh, talking content just talking head content, you know, meaning, meaning you're framed, we can talk to you. It's, it demands attention, you know? When somebody gets in front of you in person and goes, hey man, hey, you're just like, I got your attention for at right. least three seconds until you start saying some dumb shit, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Then, and then you lose me. But if you show your face and you start talking, I'm like, all right, what you got to say? Yeah. And then I might listen, might, might not, but I'm saying that's it. It's very different than when you're just showing me a tattoo, no anything else behind it is different and a lot of times like what you were saying if like the like you're saying that the instagram algorithm like the, the algorithm has been better for your content for your uh, financial content than it was for your tattoo con content i think it has a lot to do with that it has yeah. a lot to do with that with the fact that you know if you start the content with you talking about what you're doing and showing your excitement and everything and then later you lead with everything else then it'll kind of like builds a storyline of like what's happening. And I feel like there's many ways to create tattoo content. And then uh, I think I've had the, the, the hurdle of talking to tattooers that work with me of like, hey, like I know that you like to see things from a tattooer standpoint, but I want you to think about like, what do customers like to see? Yeah. And even the, I mean, Instagram as a whole is a whole loaded topic. And tattooers, myself included, have been so resistant to, dealing with it and I get it. It's like, it, it feels like I, I just, again, I just want a tattoo. I don't want to deal with taxes, investments, Instagram, none of it. I just want to do cool tats. That's it. I want to make art. But if you, if you truly just want to do cool tats and you're not trying to make a living, don't try to fuck with Instagram then. Don't, if you don't want to do it, don't. But like you said, you're a business. I don't care if you work at a shop and you're getting 50%, you are a business. And you need to treat yourself as such. And what do businesses who want to make money do? They market themselves. And how do, what's the best and easiest and cheapest way to market effectively? It is Instagram. It's free. It's free. It's free. You know? And if we're in an ocean, and I, you know, all these have to talk about, oh, it's oversaturated. Every time you complain about the industry being oversaturated, you're just wasting your energy. Seriously. You're just complaining. And any complaining about money or time, is it's energy that you could be investing in being better on Instagram. Right. So- Anytime, but you're, but you're not wrong. Okay. There are a lot more tattooers. And when you just search through Instagram, you know, I meet all these tattooers, I'm seeing all these pages and look, I know some of you do some special, beautiful styles, but like at the end of the day, sometimes it kind of, kind of looks all the same. Like from an inch, when you're on a three inch screen, you know, it's like, yeah. So how do you stand out in an ocean where everyone's kind of, there's so many sick tattoo artists. Doing everybody's really good right everyone's now. Everyone's really yeah. fucking good. Yeah. Everyone's, yeah. Just really, say, yeah, everyone's really good. Yeah. So what is your ideal client? And this is something Russ talks a lot about. Is like, who is your ideal client? Think about them. And he does a whole presentation talking about how at his shop, each client, each artist, they did like an ideal fit for their, who's your, you know, is your ideal client play nerdy board games? Does your ideal client love to cook? You know, do you like, they have a tattooer that mostly does like food related tattoos, you know? And so thinking about that and then Create some content that speaks to that person. Absolutely. And it makes your, even your, your, your work uh, more meaningful to you because you're yeah. doing work that you really enjoy. Like if you're, if you're all about doing, you know, food tats, vegan tats or something like that, and you get to connect with that audience, man, you're stoked. 
they're stoked because they're getting to talk to somebody they connect with in a deeper level than just the image, you know, and, and just here's the, the thing, tattoo. Matt, do you really want to yeah, tattoo awesome, someone you know? that doesn't want to look at your face? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want to tattoo. So post your face. Yeah, no, you're right. And you're lose right. those followers. Dude, when I started. <laughs> lose those followers. <laughs> Fuck them. Yeah, lose those fools, bro. When I switched from tattoos to finance stuff, I lost so many fo- in droves. Droves. And I was like, oh, man, this feels so shitty. Like, what the fuck am I doing? I feel stupid. I feel judged. And then I would get messages from people and they'd be like, thank you so much. Who, no one is sharing this information. I love that you're doing this. Thank you. Keep And that one message, if anyone who <laughs> sent me messages early on, I want you to know how much that meant to me. It was meant the world because I was losing all these followers. I was like, what the hell am I doing? Is this a mistake? And then someone would reach out. But ultimately, Fuck you. Stop following me. If I'm not trying to tattoo anymore and I'm really trying to focus on what I feel is important and that post, if you post your face or you post something and people stop following you, good. They were never going to work with you anyway. So let them fucking stop following. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right? Yeah. And it just weeds out the uh, the important people. Really. Exactly. Yes, yeah. man. And if only 3% of your whole audience is ever seeing your fucking posts, then actually you want people to stop following you. Because then the people that are going to see your matter posts are, are the people that really points. fucking matter. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Absolutely. Like, you know, Nas has a line in, in a rap song where he said, talks about, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, I'm not for you and you're not for me. And I feel like you have to make your content be, you know, like you're saying, to the audience that you're trying to reach. And the more you can connect with those people, you're going to lose the freaking wishy-washy people that are not about what you're trying to do. You know, so make content for for that audience that really wants to see your shit. They really are about you. They support you because at the end of the day, if you're just doing this for like like what we're talking about, like just for a bunch of people that are just even just following you because they're following you, but they're not necessarily passionate about what you're about. You know, then honestly, that just lowers your engagement in the algorithm, guys, right. and then that makes your your stuff dump. You Sorry. know, it doesn't get shown to more people. Because that's how like the algorithm works. It, it it grabs a block of people, shows it to them, and if you have a big group in that little first block that says we love this shit, and I'm like, let's make this block bigger, and it just keeps increasing. And as long as like the majority keeps liking, it keeps growing. And the more people that like it, the more people get to see your stuff, and the more you're gonna connect with people that are gonna really, really be into your work, your personality, what you're about, and that's fine. You know what I'm saying? You can't be afraid to lose some. You win some, you lose some, right? Yeah, so. you're not you're not for everyone, and that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. that's a yeah. good thing. All right, cool. Yeah, I feel like we could uh, ramble about this for a long time, but I think that we should save all of that stuff for another episode. Yeah. Um, cool. Like you said, I'll gladly come back anytime you guys yeah, want. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Um, so I, I said before that I want to, to I put a pin on something that I want to come back to. Yeah. So you were talking about how your money as the tattoo business is not your money, right? Yeah. So- um, one thing that I was told was that, um, from other people is like, you should pay yourself a salary. You should pay yourself. You give yourself a paycheck. If you have a business, pay yourself a paycheck from the business. I'll be back, guys. And then that, that'll be like your, your play money. Um, my accountant was like, don't worry about that. You are the business. Everything is one. Um, you know, Matt Triano is Apparition Studios. That's my LLC, mm-hmm. right? So whatever money comes in from Apparition Studios, you can pay your um, you could pay your business expenses there. If you got to pay your personal bills, just take some money out of the business checking account, put it in your personal account, and pay those bills. Right. Keep it separate. Um, but as far as paying myself a salary that was never a conversation with me and my accountant, yeah. but I've heard other people talk about that before. Yeah. Is there, is there a difference? Should I be doing one or the other? Yeah. Like how do, how do you feel about that? So this is actually uh, a good distinction to make. So there's two, when you're talking about anything business, there's tax, there's a tax perspective and then there's the business perspective. And they're actually two very different things. So like profit from a tax perspective is gross income minus expenses equals net profit, right? But you could profit $100,000 in your business and have no fucking money at the end of the year. So that's not real. So from a business standpoint or a personal finance standpoint, profit is what you save and keep for the future, right? And I'm going to get to the salary thing, but I just want to make that distinction because a lot of people think 
that they, I'll be like, okay, how much are you saving? They're like, oh, I save $1,000 a month. I'm like, cool, you've been saving that for the last year, so you have $12,000. They're like, no, I have $2,000. I'm like, okay, so you didn't save $1,000 a month. you know. And so when you're talking about salary, should you, shouldn't you, that's kind of the question. Like, my, here's my, here's my honest opinion. In an ideal world, yeah, pay yourself like, okay, I'm going to give myself $500 a week and I'm not going to spend more than $500 a week. In an ideal world, sure. But in reality, is that going to work for you? Probably, Probably not. not. Probably not. And so just like budgets, right? Like most people, like if they've tried anything to get straight with their money, they've tried budgeting and it didn't fucking work because it doesn't fucking work for most people. Right because it relies on you to practice self-control. And so if you pay yourself a salary, but then there's more money in the account and you could just easily take it out, you're just not gonna do it. So I don't tell people to pay yourself a salary. I have the system, when I, when I say pay yourself first, I'm really saying pay future you first. Save in accounts that you're not going to fucking touch preferably in a separate whole separate bank i have a primary bank that that's the bank that i do and i use and i look at every day and i have a secondary bank and I have tertiary and all these other banks i don't even look at those accounts like there's no reason for me to look at them money's moving into them and so that is prioritized and that happens first then here's what i do so i prioritize retirement saving for a home having an emergency savings all those stuff at the top of the waterfall right and then down at the bottom of the waterfall is my personal spending. So how do I know how much I can spend on my life? Well, I have my business account and now I kind of just pick a number that feels like that's a healthy number to float whatever my business needs. And I try to be a month ahead. So if my business generally costs $3,000 a month to operate, I always wanna have at least $3,000 in the account. So if my account has $3,000 in it, I can't take any money out. I can't pay myself anything. And that's kind of how I run it. It's like, I feel comfortable. My business account has what it needs. My system is saving for the future. And then if my account has $5,000 in it, I could take out that 2,000 and put it in my account. And so in this way, when I look at my personal account, it only ever has an amount of money that I could light on fire in it. I like that. That's the way I like to look at it. And then mentally, because that, buy shit you don't need money is not mixed in with my rent or my bills or my savings or any of that other money. It's not mixed in the same pile. When I look at that number, I naturally spend differently than if it was a big pile of $10,000, but not, some of that money is not actually money I can spend and some of it's already spoken for this. So on a strange. psychological level, it naturally, or again, I like to leverage things that already exist with you rather than be like, pay yourself a salary and don't spend more than that salary. I don't think that's gonna work for you. So I don't even try to teach that. I have a system set up that takes care of all this stuff first. And then I look at my business account. I know my business needs to have this amount of money. And if it doesn't, well, like shit's gonna go bad. So like, I'm, I'm afraid to take out. You know, and I keep upping that amount of money as my business grows. Uh, I have a staff now that helps me with this course. I have a COO, I have salespeople, I have a full-time assistant. My business account needs to have at least $20,000 in it. Otherwise, like I won't be able to pay people at the end of the month. So until my account has more than 20 grand in it, like that 20K is not my money. It's my business's money. And then I can, you know, transfer any excess into my personal account and then I don't overspend. And that seems to work for this avid overspender. I'm really good at spending fucking money on stupid <laughs> shit I don't know. I'm super talented at it. That really works for me. It's easy to get good at that. Well, I mean, I'm naturally gifted. I'm just going to say you, you know. So when you have employees a way that you do, yeah. you have a business, you have however many employees that you have that the money in that business account is also dedicated to pay those employees. Right. So, and the rent for my studio and you right. know, all these other. So if you're the only person that's a sole proprietor, right? Right. If you're the only person in the business, are right. you considering yourself as an employee no. of that business? No, okay. I'm not. In, in that instance, I'm not. I am uh, looking at, if you're just tattooing at a shop, okay, and you just need to have enough to cover your supplies, then um, you consider that your business amount. Okay, if you only need a thousand bucks a month extra to cover your expenses, then that's your number. And then separate everything else into where it needs to go. And then that last, uh, you know, whatever's over a thousand, you can take out 
into your account. And that way you, you, you might overspend on occasion, but over the long run, you're heavily reducing your overspending because that money isn't mixed in with all this other stuff. Right. Cool. Are there any cons to having an excess amount of bank accounts? Are there any cons to having, I mean, I have legitimately forgot about, I think there's a bank account somewhere. I don't even remember the website and I think I have $123 in it. And like, uh, I don't even know how to locate a bank account that you don't have the exact information. It was like this bank opened up and they had a really, banks will do this thing where they have a promotional interest rate. So if you're ever looking for a high yield savings account, I like, I use Capital One. I'm not promoted by them. I don't, you know, but they generally have a consistently high yield on their savings accounts. Other banks will bump up that high yield to be higher than Capital One's to lure you in, and then they'll lower it again a month later. So yeah. you kind of got to be aware of this when you're looking around for high yield savings. You want consistency. I don't want, so I, I got lured into one of these banks. It had like a super high interest rate. I put some money in it just to try it out, and then their app sucked. Like it was so difficult to manage which can be beneficial if you really want to save some money. Get a yeah. bank whose <laughs> app it doesn't totally let you sucks. get your money out. <laughs> because I am not going to touch that $123. Like it's if I really fucking needed it, you better bet your ass I'll fucking figure right. it out. I'll get that $123, yeah. but I'm not it's going to be really hard for me to get it. Yeah. But if I needed to, I'd fucking find a way. Yeah. You know? But as far as like um I guess like uh fees or int- like Anything that I use fee fee-less banks, yeah. you know, uh, my primary bank is Chase and to avoid fees, I have a minimum in each account of $2,000. So this is actually dope because if I have like one, two, if I like five different accounts, including personal and business accounts with Chase, right? That's $10,000 that that's the minimum. So I view that as zero, right? So 2000 zero. Right. So if my business needs 3000, I actually need $5,000 right. to operate the business. But if some shit went down and I needed 10 grand and I was out of fucking money, that's five accounts that have, They'd have the 2000 money. and it, they would charge me $12 a month to touch the money. And yeah. like, if I fucking needed it, it's there. So I kind of like having these high minimums. Um, I don't see a downside to having too many accounts, but really ideally you have as many accounts as you need and, <clears throat> and not too many accounts. I, I do have too many accounts to be honest. And, and but I'm making it work. My system's a little bit weirder than other people's. And I've been doing this a long time. So, you know, it's like follow the rules until you can break them. I, I've been following the rules right. for a while and I can break some of these rules. You know, I'll take on more debt in, in ways that I don't preach, but I'll do it in really smart ways. And I only take on business debt. So I only borrow money to make money. I never borrow money to spend on stupid shit. I only borrow to make money. And I will, I will, I will be, if I can bet on myself and I can borrow money to bet on myself to increase my income, and I've done this a couple of times, I will do it because I'd rather bet on myself than bet on the market or something like that with borrowed money, right? When we're yeah. talking, yeah. debt is a power tool. You can accomplish so much more in a short period of time if you know what you're doing, like a power tool, right? But if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get fucking hurt. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I teach people how to use debt in a, in a wise way. And I, I think to build wealth in our day and age, you actually do need you do need debt. debt. Yeah. You need debt. You need to understand debt and how debt works. You need to understand interest rates and timelines and projected incomes and all this kind of stuff. I had a client, it was weird. Towards before I became a financial coach, I sort of attracted all these clients that were in finance. And I don't know if that was the universe just like delivering. Pushing me. you into the But I, I had um, right now, so. a couple clients that worked either at hedge funds or <laughs> in like the really big, you know, finance world. And that was where I learned that lesson. And, and a client told me, he's like, yeah, I have an investment account that I never sold any of the investments. I borrowed money against the investment account at a very low interest rate because the asset you know, used to, as the collateral was the investment account, borrowed money, bought an apartment, rented out the apartment, and then the rent paid for the apartment itself. He never spent a dime of his own money. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's, that's power. Heavy. That's, power, that's fucking power. That's you sick. can buy a fucking apartment, <laughs> rent it out and never drop a dime and never sell any of your investments. I was like, I want to do that. Yeah. 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 That's sick. You borrowed against yourself and you won. Yeah. yeah. That's sick. Cool. Um, man, this was uh, loads of information. I know. I know. You know, usually like uh, we talk about a lot of. We talk shit. <laughs> we talk a lot of nonsense. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we could have yeah. broken down. We just talked valuable shit this yeah. time. Yeah, 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 we yeah, talked yeah. about a lot of valuable shit, you know? And like, these are things that are, you know, coming from my standpoint, I feel like it's a hard conversation to have, you know? 
Like talking about certain, some of these things, you know, if you know that you haven't been doing good, it doesn't feel good. Mm. You know, it's a tough conversation to have. And uh, it's something that some of you guys that are listening, if you hear some of these things and they make you want to turn it off because it, it, it makes you reflect too hard on what the fuck you've been doing. And it's like, that's not the way it's be aware, you know, be aware, take responsibility of your life. It's your future. I had people tell me that make, like they start following changes. Me. Yeah, make the changes. Yeah, yeah. take one like small start, action. Yeah. You don't have to change your whole fucking life. Yeah. Take one small action. That's how I did it. That's how anyone does it. Uh, I had someone tell me, uh, he's like, I started following you because I needed the help. But then he noticed that every time he would see a post that I made, he would like scroll past it. Like almost like it was like <sighs> triggering yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was triggering, reminder. And, but then he realized, he's like, okay, <clears throat> that, that means I need to talk to this guy. And he was really like that level of wisdom to realize that this thing that I'm resisting is actually a sign that I need to lean into it and talk to this guy. And so he booked a call with me and we've been working together and he's been doing amazing and producing incredible results. But it's funny that he was afraid at first of even looking at my posts because it was going to yeah. talk about some truth that he was not yet ready to look at maybe, you know? It's like... Uh when you're going through AA, like it's the first step, you got to admit that you got a problem, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it. yeah absolutely. Accountability. It's, it's powerful. We look at in this, you know, especially in the Western world, we look at surrender as um, uh, a weak, a weak, a weak thing. A weak, right? yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, weak yeah. people surrender. A right? big macho, that, you know, but actually surrendering and saying, you know what, the way I'm doing it is working. It ain't and working. And it's not gonna work. I I put up my hands. I'm done trying to make it work. I surrender. Someone help me, teach me. And it's that moment that you're open, you're, you're an open sponge to receive wisdom and knowledge and do something new. And that's actually the most powerful thing you can do is surrender and be willing to do whatever it takes and start at square one and take a small action. You know, that's the most powerful fucking thing you can do. That's yeah. awesome. So uh, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Yeah, let's get to the wrap point. Gonna... <clears throat> So Ryan, let's, uh, how can people find more about you? Where can they find you? Where can they get in touch with you? So, uh, I am mostly active on Instagram. I'm trying to get on some other platforms, but you know, Instagram's, you know, where it's at. So it's Ryan Roy, R O I. Uh, that's like return on investment. Return on investment. I was like, that has to be just return on investment. <laughs> that ain't the last name. <laughs> that is legit. My last, has been my last name. My it is life. your last it, name. My whole life. Wow. Holy shit. I was like, I was like, it has to be return on investment. Not <laughs> I mean, his last that's, name. That's, so that's, that's, a that's, that's like a, pff, You've been built for this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, again, if you told me five years ago, I'd be like, you're out of your fucking mind, dude. I'm never <laughs> going to do that. Um, but yeah, Ryan Roy, R-O-I, tattoo at, or at Ryan Roy tattoo. No underscores, no nothing. Just Ryan Roy tattoo on Instagram. Right. That's the easiest way. Shoot me a message. I'm very active on there. I talk to everyone in my DMs. Um, I'll answer questions. And I, I offer a free call. So I call it a clarity session. It's an hour long call. And it'll be one of the most powerful conversations you'll ever have in your life. Clarity is so valuable and I'm giving it away for free and I give it away to everyone. So anyone and everyone who's interested can book this call and we'll take a look at your life and where you are and where you want to be and what's missing. That's the key element. What's missing? That if it was present in your life right now, you'd be on track. You would feel secure. Like I'm going where I want to go. And then if it looks like I can help you with that, great. We can talk about working together. If I can't help you, you're fucked, go walk up into the woods and die. No, uh, I have resources. I know people that I can point you. So no matter what, you're gonna end the conversation being pointed in the right direction. Uh, I, I, you know, most of the people I talk to, I don't work with, to be honest. You know, either they're not ready for it or the circumstances or I'm not the right fit. Uh, so if that's the case, that's fine. And if we do end up working together, I promise you, I'm gonna change your life. That's what I do. I don't do this to kind of, sort of change your life. I do this to transform your fucking life. So when you work together, is it a, is it a course? Is it a one-on-one -on -one thing? Do they? You, so I used to work? do one-on-one -on -one and then it fucking blew up. And I was just, I had a two month long wait list. I kept raising the prices of the one-on-one -on -one coaching to, it was like kind of insane. And people just kept being like, yeah, I need it. Let's do it. And I'm like, okay. And so now I don't do one-on-one -on -one anymore. I couldn't even sustain it. And so I've created a group coaching course. The course is called The Artful Dollar. I have an online platform. I give you access, lifetime access to uh, a whole library of videos, of trainings, of how to do this stuff. So I really set you up to succeed. No one goes through this course and doesn't get the results that they're looking for. I guarantee it. I promise you, I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, we have group coaching calls multiple times a week. I have people 
all across the United States, all across the world. I have clients in Germany, Canada. We're, we're you know, probably going to work with some people in Australia soon. So, uh, you know, money is a universal language. The dialect can be different, you know, taxes and things, but ultimately it's a universal language and what I teach is very universal. So that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, man. I think guys, you know, you have an opportunity now. You think you're in its path and you're in this big S curved, extra curved path that's taking you all over the place. And there's people like Ryan that are trying to be like, hey, go that way and you'll get there faster. Right. You know? Yeah. And all it takes you for you to be willing to be like that guy that's lost and doesn't want to ask for directions right. from anybody. I, I will stop him. It's <laughs> right? like you can keep just wasting gas and not going to get to where you're that's going. Right. Or you could just admit that you are lost and just stop for a second and be like, hey, man, what's the best way to get to that place? Right. And just ask. Just pull over and ask for directions. Yes, yeah. guys. Just pull over. <laughs> just pull over, you know, and you're going to get some help, guys. Yeah. So. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show oh, today. Yeah. My pleasure. I gotta say, awesome. we need to have you back here. Yeah, lot. let's definitely make this happen again. Yeah, we gotta get sure. Russ over here. Yes. Yeah, get all of us on. That'd be fun. That'd be Absolutely, fun. that'd be amazing. Anyways, thank you guys all so much for coming to you know Honest Tattoo. I'm like overwhelmed with information today. Yeah. I'm like, wow, <laughs> it's, dude. It's, it's like drinking from the fire hose. So. <laughs> I've had, I've been on other podcasts and people said oh, I listened to it multiple times. And like, yeah, go ahead, listen. You know, there's a lot here. The value of this one conversation is. Millions of dollars over the course of your lifetime, you could take the information we talked about and it could earn you and grow millions of dollars. So use it. It's here. Yeah. It's free. Yeah, absolutely. I feel yeah. like between all of us, we have over 50 years of experience yeah. <laughs> in, in, in this tattoo life and tattoo world. And, you know, we all have different backgrounds, but, you know, all of us here, we're, you know, we're all parents now, you know, and mm -hmm. we all have families and, and, and are trying to provide them with a better life, ourselves with a better experience. A, it, it being parents and just having a tattoo life, you know? And I feel like from now on, I love that we're all just here trying to be honest this. tattooers. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think that was the whole point of this podcast for us to come in and, and, and talk about all the things related to tattooing and from a very honest standpoint and just, you know, being able to share our stories. Cause I feel like from a long term, you know, we'll be able to look at this same, you know, thing maybe hopefully we can do this five years from now and be like holy shit you remember we'll replay clips from this show you know <laughs> he'll be oh, like yeah. you know what don't don't do any of that <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to hear that <laughs> anyways cool, man. awesome thanks guys thanks for having me this is so much fun yeah oh right. uh before anything uh how can people find us so uh we've got an instagram page Honest Tattooer, and uh, we're going to be loading uh, short clips on there, and then we're going to have YouTube channel with all of the full content of uh, the entire episode on Honest Tattooer at YouTube. Um, and then also help support the show at uh, patreon.com slash honest, honest Tattooer, where uh, you can donate a couple of bucks, get some after hours content, and then uh, we're going to start answering some questions on the show for anybody on the Patreon page. If you've got a certain question that you want us to answer, we'll be happy to you know, help you out and give you any information that we can offer. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much. Yo. G Money, always, and right. my brother. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, you guys right. have a great night.